Hi, welcome to the Noise Pack. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an HP 4349B, which is a four channel high resistance meter. What I actually really am looking for is the 4339B, which is essentially the same instrument, but it has a built in power supply that can go up to a thousand volts. And this is essentially a lower model, and this one does not have a power supply. So, in order for you to measure a very high resistance, you have to supply your own external high voltage supply and then tell this instrument what that supply value is and then it will use these four channels to make different kinds of measurements. This is still a pretty nice instrument because it can measure very high resistance values as it is supposed to be and it pairs with the other unit that I have repaired in the past which is the very milliohm resistance measurement, very low end. So the both of these combined cover a huge dynamic range of resistance measurement. Nonetheless, this site bought this on eBay for about $200 including shipping, which is not bad, and it has a fault. We're going to try and see if we can fix it. But I'm still really looking for a 4339B. If any of you has one, let me know. So what happens when I plug it in and turn it on? Well, it does actually turn on. It does make a noise, but then it just hangs. I tried turning it on and off many times and, you know, try to see wait a little bit longer. It doesn't do anything. It looks like it never boots, so something's going on. We're going to have to open it up and take a look inside. And here's what's inside of the instrument, and it's really nice and clean. I think it has had a good life. Now, if I look at this, the architecture of something like this is so similar to the other models in the same series. The LCR meter, the milliohm meter, and this one, and I'm sure the 4339B are going to be all very similar. What they have to do is to just change the analog front end portion, optimize for the kind of measurement they want to do in the dynamic range they want to do it. I think all of these can actually make a vector measurement, which is needed for an impedance, which of course LCR meters all require. And all they have to do is to change the analog front end and then use the same DSP and the same digital and the same power supply to make everything work. Now we have of course power coming over here, they have a little dedicated power supply, which is exactly the same as I think the LCR meter and the milliohm meter that I also have repaired. And it goes into the main board. We do have a single digital board over here, it gets connected to the GPIB in the back, and it has a connection to the main board of course, and there's a ROM in here, which is 1996, it's a super capacitor as well, and a little beeper. So this beeper does beep, which means something must be happening in there, but it may be just not booting completely for whatever reason, and then that's the entire digital board. So we might even be able to swap it and see what happens if we run into a problem we cannot fix. Well, check this out. Here we go. I fixed it. I'm a genius. So all I did was unplug all these cables and plug them back in. So it was a very, very simple problem. I am disappointed because I was hoping we could dig into it and find a problem, but this is what happens sometimes. Sometimes the repairs are going to be silly like this, but nonetheless, it seems to be working. So we may as well explore how it works and how to measure something with it. Let's see if we can make some useful measurements. So this instrument has four channels, as we saw earlier. And actually, I was wrong about the fact that this can calculate vectors. I don't believe this instrument can. It can only report you the current and the resistance. So it doesn't have the same capability as the LCR meter or even the milliohm meter that I have here. So you have an external DC source, which this instrument doesn't have. You have to apply that yourself. And you can connect a series resistance in series with the source there that that's going to help filter things out, as well as protect the device itself, because the 4349B can only take plus or minus 50 volts at its input. But this DC source at the top, I mean, you can put 1,000 volts there, depending on the resistor that you're trying to measure. And here's your device under test. So in this situation, once you apply a DC source there, there's going to be some current flowing in. And that current is going to flow in, it's going to go through the center of the triax cable and into the instrument, and it, the instrument is going to measure that current. And because you are telling it what this voltage is, it's just going to divide those and tell you what the resistance is. It's just going to basically use Ohm's law. There's nothing unusual about this operation. Now, there are subtleties in there in terms of how you would connect this to really shield it because we're dealing with a very, very small current. So any loss of electrons that fly off the cables because of strong electric fields, especially when this V is very high, is going to matter a lot. So for example, your DOT could be a capacitor and you're trying to measure its leakage, or it could be even a cable that you're trying to find out how much leakage it has at very high voltages. All of that is possible uh, using this instrument. And these four channels are independent, so you can basically switch around uh, in any way you want. And you can use the same source for all of them. That doesn't really matter because the only thing that matters is how much current enters the instrument through these channels themselves. And that's one of the clever ways it is designed. You basically want to isolate it as much as possible. And even though it has a triax connector, the inner conductor of the triax, the, the center conductor is of course the device under test, but then the inner layer between the two is something that you don't connect to anything. And that's going to further protect and shield it to make sure that no current is lost. We can also take a look at the circuitry that does some of these functions. 
here in the service manual. And they have a simplified diagram there. So this is what we're looking at, the device under test and the triax cable. And then there's a transformer at the very input. I'll talk about that in a second. And a series resistor as the first thing. That's about a kilo ohm. And then afterwards, we have an I to V converter, which if you look at, is nothing more than an integrator. So it basically creates a slope at the output of the integrator, which is proportional to the amount of current entering the integrator. That's what an integrator does. And then by measuring the delta V between these two points and knowing the start and stop of the time, you can calculate what the current was. And you can get very good accuracy out of this because you're integrating the value of the current, which is less prone to other kinds of errors. The disadvantage of a system like this is that it can be slow, but in this case we're looking at very small currents, so some integration is indeed helpful. This also means that you cannot integrate indefinitely, because eventually you will saturate this amplifier and you won't be able to get any higher voltage. So you have to play around with the amount of current and the amount of voltage you want to measure and so on. This instrument actually is fairly manual in its operation, a lot of things you need to consider. That's one of the reasons why I like the other model better, because it does a lot of those things automatically for you. And then after that, you have some attenuation to basically level the voltage to where it should be. And then there's a multiplexer here, which is going to multiplex different, or I should say demultiplexer, which is going to allow you to select which channel, depending on how, which channel you're trying to measure. And you can actually measure them sequentially in a row. And then afterwards, just, just a simple ADC and a CPU, because here you basically have a voltage and the dynamic range here is already established because it's the front end that matters. Now there's a couple of other little things they do that's interesting. They have a clock going to a bandpass filter, which is at centered at 30 kilohertz apparently, and that's going to create a sinusoid. And they couple that sinusoid through a transformer to the middle conductor of the triax. So you can imagine that they're basically putting a tone and the middle conductor. Now remember the middle conductor is not connected to anything near the device under tester. So you, say you bring it all the way to the edge. So by putting that tone under and then measuring that value which reaches through the inner conductor, the main wire of the triax, you can find out how much you're coupling between the two of them. And between that information you can do something called a connection check or a continuity check, so you can figure out whether you're making a, the correct measurement there. This is helpful if you're making rapid measurements in some automated system, and you want to make sure that there's a sanity check, that you basically have the, a good connection being made. It's useful in that environment. Normally, I don't think most people would use it if you're just making one measurement. Uh, but it's an interesting little idea, and it is quite cool that they are using a little basically ferrite core to couple a signal in and then measuring to see how much it gets across and by the appropriate amount of capacitances in the in the triax or the capacitances that the user adds to this you can figure out if you're making connections cool idea and then the rest is just basically replicated so now that we understand it we should be able to go and try and measure something i have a one gigaohm resistor which is a you know, fairly large value we can try and see if it gives us anything reasonable so let's measure our gigaohm resistor on a couple of instruments using traditional methods before we try it on that to make sure our measurements actually make any sense. So here I have a banana connected directly to the instrument and then we have the one gigaohm resistor on two alligator clips. Now the resistant contact here isn't so important because this resistor is so large. But the fact that it has some leads that are in the air, that does matter. You can have loss of electrons through them. And generally, this is not the best way to measure very high values of resistance. But here, we just want to get a relative value. The absolute value isn't so important. Just keep that in mind. So let's start with the key side 34588, which is the industry standard 8.5 digit multimeter. And you can see this is telling us 0.9989 gigaohm, pretty close to the 1 gigaohm value it's supposed to have. And this is running on a 50 NPLC, and everything else is basically default. So let's start with this as a default value here, and let's go and try it on a couple of other units. And here it is on the key side 34470A, which is a 7.5 digit multimeter, and we're getting 0.9979, so actually about a mega ohm of difference between these two. But again, remember, this is a giga ohm resistor, so it's a very high value, but I haven't changed the setup in any other way than just to move this. This is also a warmed up instrument as well, but you can see the values are pretty close. And here's the Keithley DMM7510 reporting almost identical value to what the Keysight one was just telling us. So I'm pretty confident that this is a correct measurement. Now we don't have to use a multimeter to do this. We can actually use an SMU, especially an SMU with a very high voltage capability. We should be able to measure this resistor under different amounts of current conditions, giving us some additional information about it. 
So using an SMU we can apply a certain voltage across the resistor or push a certain current through it and then measure the resistance from that. Now this is the Kitty 2470 uh, which goes up to a thousand volts. And by the way most of this instrument you see me doing experiments with I have done full teardown and review on the channel that you can find a whole bunch of experiments uh, using these instruments. So right now I'm applying two volts across our one giga ohm resistor and you can see that it is telling us a value about 0.996 or so. Now the more voltage you put across that resistor more current of course goes through it and it puts you in a perhaps more favorable area of current measurement of the Kitley unit but there are other consequences to pay for that so let's say we go from 2 volts and we actually apply 20 volts across it so now the current goes up by a factor of 10 and it's going to recalculate the value of that resistance and the resistance can change for many reasons if I put a very large value of voltage across that resistor you can have higher loss of electrons through radiation coming out from the sharp points especially because of the such a strong electric field forming between the leads and that can confuse things and of course there is the thermal effect because you're burning more power in the resistor that's also going to change it so at 20 volt across it which is probably similar to what those multimeters were doing we're getting a very very similar value to the two, to the Keithley and the Keysight measurements, about 0.997. Now, if I change that from 20 to 200, now we're putting 200 volts across that resistor. And that value is going to change the thermal behavior of that resistor and, of course, some additional losses. And you can see the value of the resistor actually changes. Now, this value, this, this could have a negative coefficient of temperature, of course, and that's why the resistance can go down or it can go up depending on what the resistor is made of. So, yeah, so this is something to keep in mind. Making very high value resistances or very low value resistance measurements is not easy and subject to a whole bunch of errors that are just not important at, let's say, mid value resistors. We can go even higher. We can put 500 volts across it. That should be still okay. Let's see what we get from there. And now we're burning a lot more. Look at that. The value is now vastly different from where it used to be. So all of that is pretty important. So now that I roughly know what the value is, let's go and try it on our high resistance meter. So I went ahead and made a test lead per instrument's recommendations to make this measurement. We have a triax connected which connects to the front of the unit and it ends up in this connector. And this connector has the inner sleeve all the way up to there as short as possible. This is the only part of the connector which doesn't have the outer shell of the triax connecting to it for protection, of course. And here's where the bias is coming in. The bias is going through a switchable resistor box there to protect the instrument, of course. And we put our load between these two clips and then that should hopefully allow us to make the measurement. And we apply a DC voltage over here. We enter that and we should be able to make the measurement. So now we can use the SMU to generate the voltage that we want. That's a precision instrument, of course, and it can go up to 1,000 volts. And I have already connected our giga ohm resistor in our setup. Let's take a look. Okay, so here we are. I don't have the voltage enabled right now, but the very first voltage I want to use is 5 volts, and I've already entered it over here. Now, the setup is not very well shielded. You can see we're measuring some stray voltages and currents that are appearing there, which are being calculated as this value of resistance you're looking at, and that resistance, you know, is 10, 10, 10, 1 times 10 to the 14 ohms sometimes, a very large value. If I just bring my hand close to the resistor and just move it around, you can see I can change that value back and forth. So it is measuring very high values. It needs to be much better shielded if I want to really measure something at you know 10 to the 14 ohms. So let's go ahead and enable the voltage there. There it is. There's our 5 volt enabled. Let's wait for it to stabilize. And check it out, 9.97 times 10 to the 8. So it is 997 mega ohms, just like the other meters were reporting. The only meter that was reporting a little bit higher was the key side, but the other two were actually in quite good agreement. So it works. It seems like it is measuring the right thing. Let's change the voltage a little bit, go to a higher value. So instead of 5 volts, let's try 10 volts. Now, of course, I have to come over here and change that. Here's 10 volts. There we go. We're getting again the same value, 9.973, which is what we were expecting. We can make the voltage much higher. You can try 100 volts and go to 100 volts here. There we go. It's still the same value. And by the way, we can also measure the current. If I go under the measurement parameter and change it to I, you can see that it measures the current, which is 100.23 nanoamp, and it's basically dividing those two. That's how it's getting the value of the resistance. So this thing goes down all the way down to picoamps, of course. So let's go back to the voltage one more time. We can make the voltage even larger. We can do 250 volts. Now, once I do that, we should see the resistance begin to drop. 
let's see what we get there you go look at that 9.92 so indeed it is going to drop and we saw the same thing when we were using the SMU to push a lot of current in it now we're burning a lot of power in the resistor and indeed is changing its value so it all seems to be working correctly now I don't have a lot of very high value resistors here in the lab but we have these ones that go to 1 times 10 to the 10 so that's still 10 times larger so let's go ahead and try one of these these are not very precise by the way plus or minus 10 percent but they should be cool to measure so let's measure that at a hundred volts. I'm going to enable the voltage here again. And let's see what it stabilizes to. 1.17 times 10 to the 10. Wow, it's actually quite a bit off. So these resistors are really old. Let's try one more. Well, the second one is also way off, and this one, this time in the other direction. This is 8.2 times 10 to the 9. Yeah, these resistors are definitely not precision. And here, just for fun, looking at the exact opposite range, using the 433B, measuring a 5 milliohm resistor and you can see you can measure it quite well and of course because I'm moving it around but once you stabilize the setup it's actually really really precise and accurate so yeah these are the two extreme ends of these instruments and there you have it I hope you enjoyed this video even though the repair itself wasn't really that interesting let me know what you think in the comment section hopefully you still enjoyed the experiments and I'll see you next time